that is not the case. And it's beautiful when you start getting out to the edge of things and understanding how early we as people started to really understand the shape of the world and the shape of the universe. Armand Fizeau was an experimental physicist in Paris in the mid-19th century. And his specialty was replicating and refining the experiments of others, which may sound uh, slightly quotidian. In fact, this is the soul of science, is confirming results. Nothing is a fact until it's been independently corroborated. Uh, and he, he was a, a familiar with an experiment by Galileo. Galileo had tried to do some experiments into the speed of light. His experiment seems quaint to us now, but uh, it was genuine. He, he decided to see if light had a speed. Maybe he could discern it by flashing a lamp at his assistant. So he and his assistant stood in front of each other right here, and they got very good at the timing. Galileo would open his lamp, and his assistant would open his lamp, and they would get their timing really, really tight. And then they moved to hilltops about two miles distant and tried the same thing. The theory was, was that if there was a speed to the light, there'd be a delay in the flash coming back from his assistant. But the speed of light was too fast for Galileo. Um, he was about a thousand times off his estimate of its speed. But Fizeau thought about this experiment of the burst of light, of the pulse of light. And he ended up refining Galileo's experiment and perfecting it with nothing more than a, a toothed wheel. So I want you to try and picture this in your head because understanding it is something that gave me great pleasure the first time I read it. So picture a wheel. Uh, this, his wheel was actually quite large. It had 720 teeth around the perimeter. And so it's a toothed wheel. So there is a tooth and there's a notch. And then there's a tooth and then there's a notch. So let's think about this wheel while it's stationary. I shine a light through one of those notches and I reflect it back to myself in a mirror. You can understand clearly that the beam of light you're seeing is going through the notch, through the mirror, and coming right back to your eye. He had a beam, slitter, beam splitter, so he was able to look directly down the beam. Now, if I move that wheel, I'm going to talk to the young kids here because I really want you to get this. If you move that wheel one notch, the, the light will flash to you. You'll be looking at it through the next notch. So you start to spin this wheel. The light being reflected back to you begins to pulse. It begins to pulse. Now, Fizeau was doing this with two towers that were five miles apart in Paris. And as he began to spin this wheel up, he started to notice the reflection from the mirror that was coming back to him started to become occluded. It looked almost to his eye like a door was closing. Now, remember, actually, also you should note, determining the speed of light with a laser and some electronics is a, re is a very common early physics experiment for college students. But Fizeau had to construct this experiment so that he could see it with his eye. This was the threshold we had until maybe 75 years ago. We didn't have counting equipment. We didn't have electronics. The eye was what had to notice this. So he starts to see the wheel is spinning, and the door seems to be closing on the light. What is happening is really amazing. He's pulsing a light through the toothed wheel. And as he spins it up fast enough, the beam is reflecting off the mirror, and it's not making it back in time. It's actually hitting the tooth of the, next, of the next tooth. And eventually, as he spins the wheel fast enough, he fully occludes the light. He's spinning this wheel, and he can no longer see the reflection in the mirror. Then, based on the math of the circumference of his wheel, how fast it's spinning, how far away his mirror is, he calculates the speed of light to within 2% of its actual number in 1849. And this, this, is, this is what thrills me as the gentleman scientist that I am without any proper accreditation. Is that when you look at the people that have discovered what they discovered, and, and I do this actually whenever I have a difficulty understanding a concept, I actually go back and I read about the people that first came up with it and their first experiments into it because it helps me get that clarity. When you look at the discoverers and what they discovered, you see that they're not so different from us. They're, we are all bags of flesh and water trying to answer questions. And these people are just people that ask these questions a little more precisely. They thought about it a little more with a little more obsession. And in doing so, they cracked apart nature.
and started to look inside and see how beautiful it is. And by doing that, they actually changed the world. And so can you. Thank you. What kind of inspiration we need? Now, Hinke, the floor is yours. We'll, I will ask for some questions. We'll have some time for some questions. Thanks a lot, Ed. Yes, welcome, everybody. I uh, hope everybody's English was as good as they imagined, because normally you see Mythbusters with subtitling. Um, I know there are a lot of people who have questions, so uh, I'm going to walk through the room. Uh, raise your hand when I'm near, and I'll repeat the questions so Adam can answer them. Adam, what's your name? Christian. Christian asks if you ever busted a Dutch myth. Busted a Dutch myth. The boy with his finger in the dike? I, we have not done it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Did you bring your hat or can I have it? I don't understand the question. Maybe you do. Did you bring your hat and can I have, can I have it? Ah, my hat? Oh, your hat. My hat. Oh, not your head. Uh, no, you can't have my hat. <laughs> um, you know, I've been doing this show so long, I now have um, five of those hats. Uh, they get beat up, and I have them lined up like trophies in my man cave in uh, San Francisco. <laughs> and no, they're, they're n I, I may donate one to charity someday. Another question from? How is your out-of-work relation with Jamie? How is your out-of-work relationship with Jamie? Um, my out-of-work relationship with Jamie is very interesting. Um, we, don't, we don't like each other. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding at all. We drive each other cra We annoy the crap out of each other every day. I can't stand to listen to him talk. He can't stand to hear me go on. Um, that being said, we have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. And it is, there's a strength in that respect and in the dislike. Number one, we're not afraid to say something that will hurt the other's feelings because we don't care. And while we both have healthy egos, to be sure, we, are, we consider it a point of pride that the right idea always wins. It doesn't matter whose it is. And there's a bunch of times in the history of the show that neither of us could tell you who came up with the perfect solution for the thing. It just happened. So, you know, I'll say, why don't we do it A to B? And he'll say B to A. And I'll say A to C. And he'll say C to A. And we'll just argue back and forth. And at a certain point, somebody will go, well, one of us will say, well, you just put a ladder up to it. And we'll go, oh, right, that's exactly right. That's how we're going to do it. Um, and so I, I, every great partnership that I know, the magicians Penn and Teller are friends of ours. Uh, I have a couple of friends that, that, that produce the show Big Bang Theory in, in, uh, in the United States. And both of those, all three of these partnerships that I know of are, are based in conflict. There's, there's no people who work together constantly that aren't in regular conflict. But there's a strength and an integrity to that conflict. It, it, the integrity is that your own idea always has to be checked against somebody else's. It's, it's got to be corroborated. And if you think that it's the best, you better fight for it being the best because you know that it is. And it really yields, unfortunately, much better results when we work together than when we work alone. I've got another question here. What's your name? Dani. Uh, Dani. Of the ooit's opgevallen dat hij zeg maar de grappige van de kleur is. Did you ever notice that you're the funny one of the two of you? Ah, if Jamie was standing here, I'd be twice as funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. I I took that on really early. You know, I realized that some of my favorite performers are comedians, and that a good comedian knows that. Being humiliated is the soul of comedy, so 
I have been naked on national, international television. I've contributed every bodily fluid that I can think of to this show. Um, I've been hurt, I've been bounced, I've been burned, and I love it. I, I also realize there's something universal in that. I mean, you know, my, the source of my funniness comes from a deep felt desire to get it. I wear those costumes not because of the show. I actually owned all those costumes before we filmed the show. <laughs> I'm just excited to have an excuse other than wandering around the house while my wife isn't home to wear them. So it's genuine. It's, it's, you know, and I recognize that's funny and weird and why not? Let's, let's, make, let's show me being funny and weird because everybody is and there's a universality to that. I've got another question here. Does it bother you at all that uh, producers might cut out scenes that you uh, might want to view, uh, show on television? Absolutely. Um, I'll tell you, it's much worse in the United States where we have an extra... You guys see a Mythbusters that's 52 or 53 minutes long? Uh, that's the cut that I see, the rough cut. But in the U.S., they cut out eight minutes. We get 44 minutes long. Um, and. I don't know who does the cutting, but they seem to have a special penchant for removing the punchlines to my jokes. <laughs> um, also, at times, entire experiments will be missing. The, that's actually one of the places where the growth of the, of the World Wide Web and the Internet has really aided Mythbusters, because uh, if, those, if those segments get cut out, they show up on the web, and we'll, you know, we have a forum for people to be able to see stuff. Another question at the front. I think they're your f super friends in here. Uh, what's your name? Yeah, um, after the arc accident, how long did it take for your eyebrows to, go, to grow back? Uh, did you all, all understand that? Yeah, I, yeah. I had an accident with a, uh, with a, uh, trying to set fire to a cubic foot of gasoline, and it ended up burning my eyebrow off the night before a date. <laughs> um, what I find most funny about this is also sort of, you know, I'm laughing hysterically and I'm saying, am I missing an eyebrow? And it's been used in the opening credits for a, you know, a million years. But uh, if you watch the whole segment, I'm going, <laughs> am I missing my eyebrow? And Jamie goes, yeah, and half of your hair. And I go, what? <laughs> I lose all my good humor. It wasn't as bad as that. Um, in fact, I'd merely singed my eyebrow so that it was just, I smelled a little like burnt hair for a couple of days. It wasn't that bad. I see someone at the back. I'll go a little closer. Well, he talked about his man cave at home in San Francisco. Does he think every man should have his own cave? <laughs> Does every, but every man need his own cave? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I didn't call it... I've always had a shop. I've always had a place for my stuff. I have a lot of stuff. Um, I'm a high-functioning hoarder, <laughs> which means that I can afford storage spaces for all the crap that I have. Um, and recently, my wife and I moved into a section of San Francisco where there's all, pretty much no parking at all. And we have one garage space, and we had to use it for a car, unfortunately. And I, I, was, I, was, I did without a shop for a couple of months, and my wife pointed out, you know, we could rent you a space around the corner. There's, this, is, this is an industrial district. There's a lot of spaces. And so I rented an auto shop around the corner. And around the same time, I met the director, Guillermo del Toro, who has since become a, a very good friend of mine. And when I first met him, he's, the first thing he said to me was, Call me up. Come to my man cave. And I thought, oh my God, wow, yes. So uh, two weeks later, I flew down to Los Angeles and his man cave is, it's actually, he calls it Bleak House. And it is a Victorian mansion, I'm not kidding you, that nobody lives in. It is merely for his intensely large collection, a mansion-sized collection of weird stuff. And things, I mean, there's every...